Each sighting of a T-2 tanker, such as the Marine Sulphur Queen, was investigated. Ship after ship was checked out, but none proved to be the doomed tanker. In June 1969, at a deposition hearing in New York, a retired sea captain, George H. Grant, theorized that the tanker had encountered a freak giant wave, rolled over, and sank. But did the Marine Sulphur Queen go down? A more presumable theory is that she went up. Coast Guard investigators discovered that before she vanished, she was plagued by a series of fires in the insulation chambers between the sulfur tanks. Could fire have broken out aboard the ship again? Could a panic situation have ensued at the thought of fighting fire and explosion at sea? Could those who attempted to fight the fire have become overwhelmed by the toxic sulfur fumes? Sulfur fumes that could have radiated throughout the vessel by way of the air ducts and ventilators, overcoming all hands, including the radio operator, even before a distress signal could be transmitted. Could the marine sulfur queen have become so disseminated in sulfur fumes that she became a floating bomb? And when the cold seawater came into contact with the molten sulfur, Shortly after the Marine Sulphur Queen was listed as missing, Miami boat builder John Almond and his son were driftwood hunting on Key Biscayne, Florida, a short distance from where President Nixon's Winter White House is located. As we walked along, suddenly we saw this bird in the water, semi afloat and semi up on the beach. My son ran over to it, and he saw immediately that it had uh, most of the letters of the the words Marine Sulphur Queen on her. So we turned the board over and could see that the back had been blackened and burned, but that the front uh, of the board where the letters were were relatively untouched, and so we speculated that it had been blown off with some force from the bridge of the uh, Marine Sulphur Queen. A remarkable number of incidents in the Devil's Triangle have occurred during the Christmas holiday season, presumably a time of joy and merriment. One of the more occult occurrences concerned a Christmas time flight of a DC-3 airliner. Ideal flying conditions prevailed as the plane took off from San Juan, Puerto Rico, her destination Miami, Florida. A thousand mile flight that was scheduled to land just before dawn was under the command of Captain Robert Lindquist of Fort Myers, Florida. Aboard were 32 passengers, including two babies, in addition to her crew of three. Laughter and joy filled the cabin. We're all singing Christmas carols, radioed Captain Lindquist. At 4.13 a.m., minutes before she was due to land, the plane radioed, we're approaching field, only 50 miles south of Miami, all's well, we'll stand by for landing instructions. We can see the lights of Miami now. The tower operator acknowledged the message but he received no reply to his landing instructions. The plane and all 35 aboard her had vanished within sight of Miami. Her last reported position was over water no more than 20 feet deep. And it was during the 1967 Christmas season that there befell another chapter to the Devil's Triangle. Dan Burak, a Miami Beach hotel owner, invited his good friend, Father Patrick Horgan, a Catholic priest from Fort Lauderdale, aboard his cabin cruiser to behold the Christmas lights of Miami from a mile out at sea, a mile that was to stretch 
into infinity. At 9 p.m., Miami Coast Guard received a message from Burak that his boat had struck a submerged object. At 9.03, a Coast Guard crew was on its way to assist. These were men who knew these waters like the back of their hands. They were professionals. Meanwhile, the two men, knowing their boat was unsinkable due to built-in flotation chambers, had little to do but watch the lights from the vicinity of buoy number seven, one mile off Miami Beach. Burak's original 9 p.m. call to the Coast Guard was the only communication received from him. There were other boats out that night, but apparently none heard or responded to the call for assistance. Unaware that they'd be spending their Christmas searching for a missing boat, the Coast Guardsmen reached the location given by Burak, but found only the buoy marking the ship channel into the harbor there was no sign of the disabled boat or its occupants. Even though the missing boat was last heard of in an area lit by the glow of lights from Miami Beach, she was still in the Devil's Triangle. After the search was called off, a Coast Guard spokesman said, we presume they are missing, but not lost at sea and missing they were. Father Patrick Horgan, Dan Burak, and a 23-foot cabin cruiser that lived up to its name, Witchcraft. Traditionally, the breaking of a bottle of champagne against the bow of a new vessel as she is about to be launched assures her of good luck and fair sailing. It was a gala occasion when publisher Harvey Conover launched his new boat, Revenock, at Mamaroneck, New York. The event was attended by sailing enthusiasts from all parts of New England. For Revenock was going to be the boat to beat during the upcoming racing season. She was designed for racing on the high seas in all weather, and there were few skippers more able than Harvey Conover. After a summer of successful competition in her home waters, the Revenock was brought to Florida, where these actual films of the Conovers were taken aboard her. After spending a joyous Christmas in Key West, Harvey Conover, his wife, daughter, and son-in-law, set sail for Miami, 150 miles to the north, a course on which they would always be in sight of land. But nevertheless, it was still 150 miles in the Devil's Triangle. As the year 1957 was ending, a massive search was beginning, for Revenock had vanished. Another offshore sailor of great acclaim is Richard Bertram, world-renowned yacht builder and a personal friend of Harvey Conover. There's so many things that could have happened. I've heard a number of people come up with a theory that she had to be run down by a vessel because Harvey Conover was too good a sailor to have a, a yacht lost. But there can come conditions uh, that can be too much for the best of sailors. They can be freak waves, there can be failure of the best of uh, equipment. Uh, the human element, uh, Harvey was short-handed in this passage from Key West to Miami. Uh, under the severe conditions, they could have gotten just too tired. Uh, there's so many things that could happen that uh, really speculation is, uh, is interesting, but not at all conclusive. 
On January 29th, 1948, a British South American Airways Tudor 4 airliner, the Star Tiger, was en route from London to Kingston, Jamaica, with a stop scheduled at Bermuda. One hour before she was due to land, her pilot, Captain D. Colby, made a routine radio communication to Bermuda Tower. Nothing in the message indicated trouble, but the airliner had penetrated the Devil's Triangle. The Star Tiger, her crew of six, and the 25 passengers were never heard from again. They had vanished without any trace whatsoever. Less than a year later, on January 17, 1949, another British South American Airways liner, the Star Aerial, soared skyward at 7.42 a.m. from Kindley Field, Bermuda, with a crew of four and 20 passengers, bound from London to Kingston, Jamaica. A short time later, her pilot, Captain J.C. McPhee radioed that the four-engine Tudor 4 had reached cruising altitude and was switching radio frequency to Kingston. On duty as air controller at Bermuda Tower that day was Henry White, who now, two decades later, is an oceanographer at Nova University Oceanographic Laboratory. It wasn't uh, until about a half hour after the Tudor 4 left the runway in Bermuda that we were alerted that there was a possible aircraft disappearance. It could have been a communications failure. The British Cable and Wireless, who handled the commercial aircraft after they left the Air Force Control Zone, notified us that they could no longer receive the Tudor 4. We attempted to contact it on our military frequencies, but without success. Once again, as ideal flying weather prevailed in the Devil's Triangle, another aeroplane, without any illusion of distress, flew off into the unknown. The history of Japanese seafaring is adulterated with legends of sea monsters, demons, and ghost ships. But the seas of Japan are a great distance from the Devil's Triangle. The crew of the freighter Raifuku Maru no doubt found it most opportune when they signed on in January 1921 for a voyage that would take them from their frigid home waters to the warm waters of the Caribbean and tropical Atlantic, and presumably on to New York. But as the ship steamed past the Bahama Islands, the Japanese crew found that Madison and blaspheme also existed in the waters of the Western Atlantic, for the last that was ever heard from the Raifuku Maru was the message, danger like dagger now, come quick. Then, silence. On June 5th, 1965, a twin-engine C-119, the airplane known as the Flying Boxcar, took off from Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. Aboard were eight Air Force reservists from General Mitchell Field and an airman hitching a ride. Their destination? Grand Turk Island in the Bahamas. But they never arrived at their goal. The plane, part of a troop carrier wing which boasted no accidents in eight years, disappeared without a trace. The plane took off that fateful afternoon into what was described as good flying weather. The pilot, Major Louis A. Giantoli, was a combat veteran of World War II in Korea. Routine radio communications were made as the plane left the coast of Florida behind and headed southeast into the Devil's Triangle. About the time the C-119 was due to land, the tower operator on Grand Turk picked up a strange, uninterpretable message. Did Major Giantoli send it? What was the last thing he saw on his flight into oblivion? Sky and sea hide the answer. 